Good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are. Welcome to the first technical workshop of the Man Managing Digitizations Project Module, which will cover strategy and purpose in digitization. This workshop is brought to you by the Digital Empowerment Project, a nationwide initiative organized by the six U.S. Regional Museum Associations, dedicated to providing free self-paced training resources for small museums. This inaugural series of online trainings focusing on digital media and technology topics is made possible by funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. My name is Avery. I am your host for today's program. My pronouns are she, her. I am a white, fair-skinned female with brown wavy hair today pulled back and to the side, wearing red rimmed glasses and I'm wearing a blue button down shirt. I am located in my home office and behind me is a white wall with two windows. A small bookcase also sits behind me, which houses museum related texts and various knickknacks that do change throughout the year. This technical workshop will address the why and who of collections digitization projects, including why your project matters and to whom, the importance of defining your digital collection projects purpose, understanding audience and interfaces, the role of digitization in your museum's access strategies and how communities will use your digital collection, and how to use metadata for findability and to support public use and access. In this era of virtual meetings, when digital spaces may substitute for our physical sense of place, it is important to reflect on the land we each occupy and honor the indigenous people who have called it home. I am speaking to you today from my, Erie, from my home office located in Erie, Pennsylvania, the historic and ancestral homelands of the Erie people, which later became part of the Seneca and the greater Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Wherever each of us are located, let us acknowledge all indigenous nations as living communities, their elders both past and present, as well as future generations. We, the Digital Empowerment Project, recognize that our organizations and those of our members were founded within a colonizing society, which perpetuated the exclusions and erasures of many native peoples throughout the United States and beyond. We ask you to reflect on where the places where you work and reside and to respect the diversity of cultures and experiences that form the richness of our world and our profession. Before we begin today's presentation, a few housekeeping notes. I'd like to acknowledge today's American Sign Language or ASL interpreter who will be situated on the left-hand side of your screen during the presentation. Captioning for today's program is embedded in a box just below the video player on our website with controls to adjust your experience. The best way to continuously refine our craft is to listen to our attendees. So we ask that you share your candid feedback with us. Following today's program, you will be sent a link to a satisfaction survey. Sharing your experience through this survey will only take a few minutes and will greatly improve our work. During today's program, we will address as many questions as possible. However, sometimes we are unable to answer all of those questions as others may arise when reflecting on the program. So we have set up an online community for raising questions, posting answers, and connecting with your fellow museum practitioners. If you are looking for help in between programs or have questions in between programs, please visit the forum on our Museum Learning Hub website and click on join in the upper right hand corner to create an account and to post your questions. A member of the community or one of our student technology fellows will respond to you. Lastly, please be sure to follow us on social media to stay in touch and to be notified of future programs. Links to our social media channels will be posted in the chat area. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's presenter. Today's presenter is Dr. Rhonda D. Jones, Community Digital Archivist, Special Collections and University Archives at the University of North Carolina Greensboro. Working at the intersections of public history and archives, Dr. Jones is an international scholar who specializes in cultural memory and digital heritage informatics. She is passionate about reducing barriers to information by addressing the capacity gaps of cultural heritage traditions in underrepresented communities. Whether the task is teaching, conducting research, scheduling programs, audience, man 
audience engagement, public relations, or public speaking, her work centers on managing innovative research projects that help individuals and community organizations document and preserve their own history. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Rhonda D. Jones, and let's begin our presentation. Uh, Dr. Jones, take it away. Hello, thank you so much, Avery. Thank you, Tori, for interpreting for me. Welcome everyone to workshop number one. This is the beginners of a three-part session on digitizing history. Um, my name is Dr. Rhonda Jones, and I am the Community Digital Archivist and Public Historian at University of North Carolina in Greensboro. I'm coming to you live from my living room in Durham, North Carolina. And I just want to uh, say again, thank you so much for signing up for today's session, and I hope that it's going to be informative and educational for you. So when we begin, let's uh, let me start my slides here. If we learned anything from COVID-19, we know that we are resilient, resourceful, empathetic, and contemplative. Even when our doors were closed and we were forced to stop what we were doing, we remained committed to the work. We were taking advantage, not necessarily of any downtime, but just a way for us to kind of regroup and restructure. And we took advantage of that time to embrace our our education and our knowledge and our skills in digital technologies. Uh, we begin to redesign or, or launch innovative, instructive and educational programs, which is why today's conversation is, is that much more engaging. So today I'm talking about managing digitization, digitization projects, the strategy and the purpose. And so as we talk about um, the why, just my personal background, uh, as I said, I am the community archivist at UNCG, and our collection, uh, we just migrated from Content DM to Islandora, and we have a new uh, prototype gateway. We're working with uh, special collections and the electronic resources and information technologies department. And so for us, our collective mission is, one, we're a public institution, and so we serve scholars, students, community stakeholders, area colleges and universities, as well as cultural organizations. And so our collection strengths are rare books. Um, we have a, a very robust women's veterans oral history collection. We have um, just have a, a, a array of slave deeds. We have a, a project, People Not Property, where we have digitized slave deeds. We have digitized runaway slave ads. Uh, then we also have various collections from the Rotary Club and, and Junior League, as well as theater, playbills, uh, an array of scrapbooks, um, artist sketchbooks, sheet music. We are, are building a very, very engaging and robust cello collection. So it's, you know, it's, it's a very, very interesting um, collection that we have amassed. And so digitization is a large part of that. We do a lot of civil rights history. We do a lot of oral history. And, and that work is, again, used for classroom instruction, for reference, for research, for scholars, as well as for community engagement. So today I wanna to talk about why are we digitizing? What are the benefits of digitization and how to plan your project? Understanding the why and for whom. So my personal entry into wanting to know more about digital projects began at Howard University, uh, Moreland Spingarn Research Center, where most historically black colleges and universities have a treasure trove of artifacts and art and history that in many cases are in need of preservation and conservation. And so there have been these alliances between um, institutions to, to pay for that, to sponsor that, to hire interns, to hire staff, to process collections, to preserve collections so that they are be sustained and available for future use. My other interest is personal and church and community archives. Um, we are part of a, a coalition of individuals who have gone around to communities of color, underrepresented communities, and we basically have had community scanning days 
We've helped individuals get materials out of the shoe box, as I call it, from out of the attic, out of the drawer. And we, you know, just kind of inventory. We help them inventory so they can have an assessment of exactly what do they have. And so if it's a church or an organization, we help them with organizing their sermons and their photographs and any kind of artifacts that they may have. Many times these events are celebratory. There's a, an anniversary coming up or a pastor's anniversary or a church anniversary. And so it's important to think about and to commemorate these events, but exactly how are we commemorating these events? My other interest is in the Endangered Archives Program. There's been a lot of talk about the archives at Timbuktu and Mali. Well, I went to Dakar, Senegal, and I got to speak with, I had the opportunity to speak with a number of individuals that were going door to door in Dakar and outskirts of Dakar and Mali and, and all kinds of places to talk to individuals who were maintaining family archives. And so in many instances, they were kept in a trunk, um, stored in conditions that were not favorable. They were not, they were decrepit, they were, they were decaying. Um, the paper was, was fragile. And so these kind of digitization projects have been useful into helping these individuals and these families preserve Ajami literature. And it, you know, it's not just West Africa, but it's all over. Uh, in the world that you have these these treasure troves, these artifacts that are being housed and stored in in ways and means that are not accessible. They're not researchable. They're not sustained. They're not preserved. And so these digitization projects have been very vital in helping us to not only preserve, but to make these resources accessible for the general public and for scholars and for researchers. You have a lot of universities that are taking the helm and doing this type of work. And so you've got University of Michigan, Maryland Institute of Technology, the Roy Rosen Wide Center for History and New Media, Stanford University. I mean, this is just a, a few compared to the hordes that are available. But just to think about that this is an, a university initiative. It's an it's a international, uh, excuse me, it's a organic initiative that is about research and outreach and teaching and it's sponsored by you know corporations and private donors and and state funds and federal funds and so it's been a very engaging way for information to be shared these groups are working collaboratively it's a way to kind of curate and aggregate a lot of the resources that are available i just read about this uh folk art museum archive that uh, there was a, it's a private collection that's been uh, funded by uh, the support for uh, the uh, National Recording Preservation Foundation. And so this is a, a, a husband and wife that were going door to door or, or having uh, artists come to their homes to be interviewed and, and to hear some of their iconic folk music between 1967 and 1988. And so they were collecting interviews in Southeast Appalachia and New Mexico. So we think about materials being in far flung places. They're not just far flung, you know, in different continents, they're far flung in our own United States. And so these are places where none of us are able to get to. We don't know about these resources. And so the benefits of having these, these digitization tools that we can document and preserve this kind of culture before it's lost. Popular culture in magazines. This is a women's magazine from Dakar, Senegal that was published between 1964 and 1973. When you think about creating spaces for interpretation, when you think about documenting cultures and, and heritage traditions, these kinds of resources are just priceless. You have drum magazine that was being printed during apartheid. And so it, it kind of gives you a purview of what's happening on the ground to these individual communities. And again, this is just, it, it's, it's a wealth of information that we can now go back and it's been documented and it's been preserved for us to do research and to learn and to share information. Digitization is also very controversial. I don't know if anyone is familiar with the situation with Johnson Publishing 
Um, they had some financial problems. Uh, John Johnson, who if you met, if you don't know, um, was the founder of Jet Magazine and Ebony Magazine, and it was just an abundance of African American cultural history that was chronicled during the 1950s and beyond. But photographers Gordon Parks and Monetta Sleet, and you know a, a host of other individuals, to show. African American life and history during a time when the images were degradating, where there was Jim Crow racism and African American history and culture was not portrayed in the best light or it was completely ignored altogether. And so Jet Magazine and Ebony Magazine, if you went into anyone's house, it was sitting prominently displayed on a coffee table and, you know, splayed out in a fan like fashion where you could see, you know, artists, popular, you know, musicians and, and entertainers and Hollywood celebrities, as well as read editorials. And it was just an uplifting depiction of African American life and history. Well, the Johnson Publishing Company ran into some financial problems and they wanted to auction off this four million um, collection of, of historic photographs. And it was it was really a lot of, of debate because it was like, well, who's gonna own this? And so what they didn't want was for the collection to be sold and dispersed to private hands. And then it was just be scattered all over the place. And so what happened was Getty, Mag uh, Getty Institute and the Smithsonian and other entities stepped forward, the Foreign Foundation, the Mellon Foundation, and they pulled their resources and the, the collection was sold. And so now the collection is being maintained at the African, National African American Museum in Washington, D.C., which is part of the Smithsonian. So the Smithsonian, the African American Museum, again, in talking about underrepresented communities, um, I thought it was really interesting that they had on their website an opportunity for individuals to contact them if they had items to donate. And so almost in the same fashion as an antiques roadshow, the Smithsonian went on the road and went to individual communities and, and groups and individuals brought their materials to be assessed and evaluated and to donate them. And so they have just millions and millions of, of artifacts. And if you had the opportunity to go to the museum, it's five levels of just everything you ever wanted to know about African-American history. And the fact that these items are digitized, if you aren't able to get to the museum, if you aren't able to go to Washington, you can see these images, these 3D objects that have been scanned because we now have the opportunity to crowdsource and because these images are available through open access, you can see Harriet Tubman's shawl, you can see a slave cabin from Odesto, South Carolina, you can see Oprah's studio. You can see, you know, sports memorabilia, household items, everything and everything that you could ever imagine is available at this museum. And so it's just one institution of many. The Smithsonian has 17 museums that in the same fashion, the items are available for visually. If you're not able to go physically, that you're able to visit these institutions and you can see exactly the the value of of cultural history and heritage. The idea of Google art and culture is just so fascinating to me. The fact that you have again open source resources where Google has partnered with two thousand institutions, and you can take a tour in your living room or wherever you are of the world's greatest museums and galleries. And so you've got themes of you know, from 80 different cultures and countries that you can explore, textiles, artifacts, music, all kind of material culture. And the fact that you can take a selfie with these artifacts, and we all know if, if you know, the, the dispute about individuals coming to museums and, and taking selfies and the pushback to that, 
Well, this is sort of a remedy for that. So the Google Art and Culture website, you know, it, again, it's it's funded and it's open resource and it's free. And if you have the opportunity to look at their website, it's a, it's a wonderful example of exactly what the power of digitization can do. The fact that you have, for example, these these digital technologies from this high resolution images that there are, you know, 3D virtual galleries that you can have touch screens, multimedia retrieval. It's just, you know, it's just shrinking our cultural and our social, our social boundaries. And so these, these barriers that used to exist because of access and, and travel has been done away. You no longer have to pay an entry fee. You no longer have to, you know, travel and go anywhere to, to enjoy history and culture. So in thinking about all of this, as you think about your own digitization projects and ideas, I was thinking about some of the questions to consider. You should think about the uniqueness of your materials. What is it about your collection that makes it so amazing that you have to share it? And do these materials support your research? Are they good for instruction? Are they for you know, scholars and students to learn from? Does digitization fit into your organization's mission and strategic plan? Are these materials in need of preservation or conservation? Are there any legal issues? Is this project feasible? Do I have the right equipment to do it? Do I have enough storage? What's the format? Do I have adequate funding? Do I need to write a grant? Is this something that we can do in-house? Do we have the infrastructure, the space, and the staffing? So you think about that in terms of your motives and your rationales. And you think about, again, answering those questions. This is doable because it serves and facilitates education and research and enhances the general public to cultural heritage. It democratizes culture by decreasing social and cultural and geographic boundaries. Visitor experiences are revolutionized. Collections management policies are reassessed. Preservation. If, if need be, is met, outreach and engagement is achieved. These programs could be offered in foreign languages. Like right now, we're having a presentation and we have an ASL interpreter. It could be more ADA compliant and accommodating. These real-time virtual object manipulations and group interactivities could be very insightful in terms of multimedia retrieval and, and virtual galleries. And also, it lastly, adds value to your collection. So the effective tools for telling your story, technically it's about accessibility. These digital copies, once scanned and, and preserved are nearly indestructible. Collections can be aggregated and shared and curated. They can be safely stored in limited space. These collections that normally would be hidden and unavailable can now be showcased and highlighted. If you have limited gallery space, you can expand your virtual presence and make your collection broader by showing the availability of in, in a di digital realm. So these rich representations, you know, it's a creative way to offer 3D visualizations. I personally am, am so floored every time I see something from the antiquities that it's been reconstructed and recreated. From an economic standpoint, I think that Digitization offers an untapped revenue um, in terms of there are many artifacts that can't be photographed because of lighting issues and preservation issues. But if they're digitized and they're rare, then the institution can possibly, you know, make an ebook or create a virtual tour and it could be ticketed and it could be, you know, a, a very personal, private retrospective of a collection. It could help with publicity and outreach and, you know, and tourism. So for those virtual visitors, if they're now coming to your location, maybe they'll become in-person visitors as well. And so it can be increased visitorship. So just to think about how these multimedia tools can offer rich linear and non-linear materials so that multiple voices can be heard. These collections are open and shareable, they're, they're well thought of, they're well designed, well crafted, 
they're audience centered, they're sustainable and scalable, they're evaluated and enhanced, and they're distributed across multiple platforms. So it is a very rich opportunity to engage and to learn in ways that we didn't and couldn't in the past. So to think about project, project planning and, and your activities, management, the expense, taking stock, and, and what resources do you have? For your pre-digitization process, you wanna think about your inventory. You wanna think about, again, surveying and evaluating and prioritizing what is exactly in your collection. So you can determine which items are of interest to your patrons. You can prioritize them according to criteria for how they're going to be used. You can prioritize them in, in terms of how the preservation would benefit the institution. You can think about intellectual property rights and copyright and ownership and making sure that you have proper provenance. You can determine which items can be safely scanned or exposed to light if, if need be. You don't wanna do any damage to fragile materials. For staffing and resources, you, you have to think about training, policy, software, recruitment. Will you offer in-staff scanning, outsourcing, or a hybrid approach? If you're gonna use a vendor, you have to think about that in terms of cost and time and what your timeline is. And be sure to establish a separate staffing plan to support digitization that's different from your staffing plan for your regular workflow. You have to think about how staff members will have to assume multiple roles, that you need a project manager who will deal with goals and expectations and staffing and being a liaison between departments, creating a work plan and managing funds, writing grants if need be. A curator who's in charge of caring for collections and displaying objects. Working with your ID department, who is going to do the database integration, who's going to write the scripts and programming. How are the, um, the objects going to be scanned and, and created and turned into usable files? If you're fortunate enough to have a committed preservation conservation staff, let them help you determining which items can be digitized or photographed. Lastly, who's going to do the scanning? You need someone that's knowledgeable about photography and packing and shipping and handling, as well as just pushing the button and scanning these items. So just a recap of, of you know, collection, grouping and description because you've now inventoried your collection. Do you have the ability to describe your materials? Do you know where they are? This will help you in terms of where are they physically located? Preservation and conservation is always an issue. What are the conditions for digitization? What is the size of the collection? Will this collection grow? And if so, at what rate? What is the format of items and quantity that you are thinking about digitization? Again, what is your timeline? What are the conditions, the legal requirements, and what funding do you have available? As always, who's going to do the work? In addition to our staff, we have volunteers, interns, and students who with proper training and supervision can be empowered to participate in the digitization process. So you have to do an assessment. Let them you know, tell you what their strengths are and what their capabilities are, what skills do they have, what are they able to do, and what training is needed. Thinking about your workspace. Do you have adequate natural lighting? Do you need supplemental lighting? Are there supplies available? Each space should be well lit and clean. Your environment should be neutral and matte with limited reflectance to minimize glare. Sometimes, you know, we don't have the ideal places to, to do this work, but if you can try to, to find a space that meets these conditions because you don't want to scan items and, and photograph items and they're fuzzy and they're, you know, you have to do them over and that just adds to the work. So I, I'm not gonna completely get into the, the background of the digitization project process because Lindsay and Elizabeth will talk more about this in workshops numbers two and three, but just in terms of, of formatting, um, you have to think about resolution, DPI or PPI, pixels and, and dots, general rule of thumb, uh, the greater the resolution, the better image quality. So average uh, 
ideal resolution for printed images is between 300 and 600 DPI. Uh, for text and documents, 400 DPI. You have to think about posters and maps, also 400 DPI. A lot of institutions have slides and negatives, and those could be uh, should be digitized with the format of, of 2,000, between 2,000 and 4,000 PPI. And I've just included some charts and some just uh, capture information about how typically most museums um, use that scale in terms of formatting. Metadata is uh, so, so hotly contested, you know, in terms of digitization, because it really is about the data of, of data. How is your collection described so that it can be discoverable? I mean, there's nothing more challenging than doing this work and, and you can't find it. No one knows where your collection is. It's housed in a way that it, you just can't get to it. So when you think about, there are standards um, there are, you know, dozens of, of fields to use in terms of, you know, how are you going to describe your collection? But as you're thinking about it, just think practically about your naming scheme and that it should be simple and, and not so complicated that your file name should follow a numerical scheme and that it should be dated in a, a, a particular year, month, date format. And there are, you know, lots of resources about METs and uh, available online. So to think also cost and, and how much does it cost? So cost digitization projects can be costly. They could be lengthy and laborious, but they are considered an investment. They're an investment that can yield substantial benefits. Um, they don't have to be expensive, a low cost, mid-range digitization project could cost between $500 and $2,500, and that could be as a flatbed scanner and a digital camera. And you can achieve the same effect with software, Bridge and Photoshop and Illustrator to highlight and enhance your images. So monetary costs associated with digitization depend on equipment, staff, whether projects will be outsourced or completed in-house or whether you'll be doing it yourself. The biggest costs associated with digitization are selection, metadata creation, and just general maintenance over time. So would you think about, you know, as you're doing your inventory and you're assessing your collection, try to choose projects that are meaningful in order to avoid the investments beyond effort and expense versus results and profit. So there, I saw this interesting uh, digitization cost calculator where you can actually put in the number of scans you have and the staff who will be doing the work and, and click save and continue and it will give you a, a round general number of, you know, per page and you can kind of give an estimate of how much this is going to cost you. Uh, there's a breakdown of processes to be performed, the preparation, the quality control, post-processing, and it just kind of gives you a, a general ballpark. It's, it's not written in stone, costs will change, it will vary as the project continues, but just to give you an estimate of how large is your collection, how many items do you have, how much work is you know required to do the work, and just to, so you have an idea of what to ask for in terms of, of grants and fundraising and your, your sponsored institutions. So this is kind of like a, just an exercise worksheet that you can identify the number of hours at how much per hour, and it just kind of gives you a breakdown of, of how you can kind of gauge for yourself and do a budget before you actually start the project and start the work. Because again, you don't wanna start something that is going to be so insurmountable that you can't complete, or it's going to take up so much of your time. You wanna do something that's going to be manageable, that's feasible, that's sustainable, and that you'll be able to maintain. So costs, again, it doesn't have to be expensive. You've got you know, a choice of flatbed scanners, high-speed book scanners, microphone scanners, slide scanners, 3D scanners, you have to think about storage costs and network tools. Thankfully, there are so many open source content management systems like Mercutu, sorry, uh, Omeka, and, and Reclaim Hosting that you know it can house and its its interface is interoperable with other programs like Omeka and WordPress and Skylar. 
Uh, and so, you know, it's it's story mapping. It, there are just so many ways that you can tell your story through digitization using these open source digital tools. Lyricist is a really interesting uh, organization. They do a lot of um, innovation and learning in terms of, of content management systems. They are open source. Uh, well, there's a it's a membership service, but they do offer community programs. I learned of Lyricist years ago uh, when they were uh, there was the Loner Ranger program because there were so many institutions that there was just only one person working there, and so Lyricist was really helpful in in helping individuals navigate this this idea of like now we're we're embarking on this project and and I'm all by myself and I'm not alone and so archive space is one of the resources that a lot of institutions use. Collection space, um, they're, from what I understand, they're making some innovations with it so that museums that use collection space that also use uh, the other program as past perfect software. Um, if you're using collection space, they're trying to get it so that collection space and archive space will communicate so that museums can communicate with archives and, and everyone will know what's in their collection. And again, this is another great way to curate across institutions or across departments and a great way to aggregate collection. So they have been around since 1936 and they have over a thousand members of libraries and academic institutions, public libraries, museums and archives in 28 countries. So their focus is uh, it's community supported open source software. They host, have hosting services and they also help with creating content and acquisition. And they also consult and they have training programs. They have courses. It's a really, really interesting um, organization. I, I believe they're based out of Atlanta. So if you think about this in terms of the post capture process, you've now scanned your items. You've got these archival masters of TIFFs with this raw data. You can edit these images in your, in your files, organize them in a desired system. You can edit your images in Illustrator, Bridge, Photoshop. You can upload and stitch them into PDF programs like Adobe Acrobat. You save them in your preferred file format, JPEGs. TIFFs of PNGs, you ingest them into your repository, and then you verify the quality of your captures. And you have to make sure that your images are distinct and crisp. And so when you're blooming, you're zooming in, they're not blurry or indistinguishable. So I just kind of included a checklist of items that you should think about um, as you're Thinking about these projects, do you know why you want to digitize? Do you have a clear understanding of the benefits of, of what you offer and to whom they'll be offered to? Do you have a clear understanding of the needs of your users? Do you understand metadata? Have you assessed the condition for materials of con for conversion? Are they copyrighted? Do you have permission? Is that going to be an issue? Do you have a plan? Have you evaluated the conditions of your, your materials? the physical size? Do you have resources and scanning guides to help you with your workflow and your naming conventions? Um, again, do you have the required metadata? Do you have accurate, excuse me, do you have the staff to scan these materials? Uh, do you have the proper equipment, the scanners, the monitors, the capturing and editing software? Is it calibrated? Who's going to do the work? Have you had the opportunity to review your images for quality, you know, and, and then the after effect of testing and refining, making sure the collection doesn't have accuracies and complete, that you can test your links to make sure that any necessary changes that need to be made before it goes live. And then you can provide these links on your website. So in all of this, you know, it's not one and done. When all of this work is completed, you still have to think about regular maintenance and updating your schedules of, of how this, this maintenance is going to be performed. So you think, what are the pros and cons of digitization? Well, it all sounds like it's a win-win in terms of inventorying. You now know what you have in your collection. The one thing about storage is sometimes you store it and you just forget about it and you, you forget what you have. You forget all of these things that you're keeping for safekeeping is kept so safely that you've forgotten that it's there. So the advantages are making these materials accessible. 
And so that you're sharing the content and sharing knowledge and you're just in, engaging with broader audiences that you've created metadata so that it's well described, that you are creating new users and you're helping them with accessibility. If preservation is an issue, you have now addressed that because you have conserved these items and, and they have now un, un, undergone, excuse me, extensive repair and, and they are saved and, and kept for future reference and future use. So there are some limitations. Um, Sometimes the optical character recognition software is, is an issue that requires additional training and information. The cost can sometimes be prohibitive for digitization projects in terms of equipment, storage, software, and hardware. Sometimes the training and expertise doesn't exist. You, you don't have that core of staffers or, or volunteers that can you know, take on such a, a hefty project. So that's just something to keep in mind if you think like, yes, it's easy and everyone's doing it and you know it's not a bandwagon system. You just really wanna be thoughtful as you plan to do these type of projects. So post digitization, you know, we think about assessment and evaluation, management and preservation, access to end users. That's our larger goal. Inclusivity, creativity, empowerment, reciprocity, trust, and collaboration. These are all important, just personal and, and, and you know, intellectual concepts that make education and knowledge valuable. So what we wanna do as institutions in keeping with our mission statements, we wanna foster a shared authority and a sense of belonging among scholars, experts, and community stakeholders. We wanna amplify our users and our people's voices by exhibiting art, history, and artifacts that tell stories that resonate at home and abroad. We wanna provide a platform for inclusive idea sharing and community action that inspires sustained civic engagement. So in closing, uh, don't worry, you're not alone. Be flexible, be inspired, and be comfortable making mistakes. And just know that there's a wealth of resources to help you with your digitization project. The FADGI, the Federal Agency's Digitization Guidelines Initiative, is, is the most you know, seminal resource about how to do these projects. Um, NARA, the National Archives, is available. They have tons of resources. Library of Congress has a very, very engaged and informative digital preservation website, um, the Canadian Heritage Information Network, the Council of Libraries and Information Resources, the Digital Library Foundation. And you know a lot of these resources, uh, Sustainable Heritage Network, they work with indigenous cultures and indigenous communities. They are available. They offer classes, they offer webinars, seminars, anything to help you to, to engage in digital digitization and digital practices. So with that being said, I thank you so much for attending my session and for watching. And I, again, am here to have any closing remarks and, and questions that you might have that hopefully I can answer for you. Um, and I will stop there. So my contact information, again, my name is Rhonda Jones and my contact information is my email, rdjones3 at uncg.edu. In terms of my phone number, we are just getting a new phone system. So that is the general phone number for Jackson Library. Um, but we are all still mostly, some of us are working remotely as I am. So um, it's always best to send me an email if you want to uh, talk further. But I thank you for being a captive audience. I really, it's been an amazing opportunity to participate and I look forward to taking any questions and speaking with you in the next couple of minutes. So thank you very much. All right, thank you, Dr. Jones. That was a great presentation and I think a wonderful uh, beginner technical workshop showing us all the skills and resources and tools that you'll need to get this project going. Who would have known that there's a, a digital you know, programs calculator to help you out with your efforts? That's fantastic. So we have quite a few questions and we'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, for those that we miss, uh, be sure to check out the forum at after the uh, presentation concludes. 
So starting off, um, you mentioned quite a few platforms that were out there, um, such as Content DM, Pass Perfect. So what uh, platforms are out there and how do they differ and compare and how do you determine what's going to be best for your organization? That's a very good question. Um, it's really trial and error. Uh, you really have to test a lot of these programs to see exactly what they can do for you. Um, it's We at UNCG, we use archive space and special collections. And then as, as our uh, larger um, storage, we use Islandor. And we have just we're recently migrated to um, from Content DM to Islandor. And we're still working out the kinks. So it, we're all still trying to figure it out. Um, for institutions that don't have the resources, again, like Omeka or um, um, Mercutu or, you know, um, they're, they're, they're free. Uh, you know, you don't get all the bells and whistles, but many of these sites are built on WordPress. And so they're, they're accessible. And, and, you know, if you build someone, if you have someone, I mean, these students are amazing that they know all the plugins and they can help you navigate, you know, all the digital technologies that, you know, you, you need to do. And so it's, it's a, amazing, you know, to think about where we, how far we've come in the digitization process, how everything was just so, you know, flat and linear. And now we can actually see these 2D and 3D dimensional objects. And, and it's just a digital camera. And, you know, you have panoptic, uh, panoramic, excuse me, um, images that you can assess and, and you can look at objects and you, they can turn. So again, like it's, it's really like trial and error. I'm, you know, I'm not an expert. I've only worked with about two or three different programs, you know, Archive It and Archive Space and yeah, Content DM, which is, you know, now a dinosaur. <laughs> Back then, a Content DM was all the rage. So it sounds like there's a lot of options to choose from. Many. That's what I'm hearing. Many. Um, so in, in kind of a shift as you work into your digitization project, uh, what are ways that people can make these projects personal. Uh, what are ways that you can approach storytelling through digitization efforts? And how do you mix that strategy and creativity without losing sight of either or? And that's a very good question because you have so many individuals that are becoming their own historians. They're becoming their own personal archivists. And so that is really what I'm passionate about. I'm trying to help them find me and I'm trying to find them because a lot of institutions, you know, are, are because you have like a program like the hidden collections um, and their grants available to digitize these, these resources that, you know, have been languishing in someone's attic or, or under their bed somewhere. These, these grants have made these collections, digitize these collections, uh, you know, it's possible. And so if you're not fortunate enough to, to write a grant like that, that you can go, you know, as, as universities, we try to outreach as public libraries, you know, we try to outreach and we try to have community days where we host individuals and organizations and invite them to come and bring their materials and their artifacts and we'll scan them for you. And, you know, this is always an issue of trust. You know, I don't want to give my things away and I don't know, do I trust you? And so all of that is diminished. And so, you know, you're there and you're seeing the process and you're seeing within a short amount of time, your images and your, your, your correspondence has been scanned and digitized and is available and uploaded for all of the world to see and share. And it's really about accessibility. So it's, it's again, like, the work, I'm so passionate about this work. I'm so passionate about, you know, just helping people document their own selves and finding a place for themselves in history. For so long, so many people have walked around thinking, I'm not special. I haven't contributed. I haven't done anything. And, you know, maybe you weren't the first or the only, but maybe you were on your in your neighborhood. Maybe you were in your family. So, you know, don't think about from a large national or international scale, global scale of, you know, I'm, I'm not a prominent individual, but you are. And so it's really empowering to see, you know, the after fact of how you can use like storyline to tell the story of, you know, someone who migrated from the rural south to the urban south to then the urban north 
and you can use maps and you can use oral history and all of these interfaces can combine into a website where you have an offering of all these different platforms that you hear audio, you see images, you see, you know, it's, it's textual. So again, I'm really excited that there's so many free programs that are available. <laughs> I am as well. And it's a nice way to see how you can involve the community in the process and be in the process as you do it. You know, it Absolutely. sounds like it's evolving over time and Absolutely. It, it's continuous in a sense. Um, the next question is, how can we best use digitization to monetize our collections? Um, how can we make that work? Again, it is, you know, we think about in terms of monetization is uh, it's how we keep our doors open. I mean, everything that we do is a business. And to think that you can offer programs through, you know, platforms that you could have users subscribe to, you know, they could be a monthly, have a monthly subscription to digital content that you can produce digital magazines and, and digital publications that you can produce eBooks that are downloadable. And, you know, a lot of, uh, of organizations are concerned about the cost of that and, and how, you know, the challenges of open access, they have loss of control of their images or that they are, they'll lose profit from rights management and reproduction. But you find that in many cases, the, the numbers of, of, you know, like people not adhering to copyright standards is very low. And that the, the, the benefits of what you can do in terms of ticketing and having, you know, private select, selected, like you can, for example, um, sell tickets to Van Gogh that's been curated across 17 different institutions. I mean, that's, that's so rare. I mean, we are so excited when a collection comes together in full, but if you're not able to get to that institution, you can still benefit from that event. And, you know, you can sell e-tickets, you can sell all kinds of, you know, merchandise, you can have an e-commerce store where, you know, items that were, again, it's a, a very select, rare part of your collection that have to make a great mug or T-shirt or, you know, um, a canvas tote bag. So, the, the, the part, you know buttons. I mean, it's just so amazing that you can walk around and think about the, the merch that is produced from all of this and, you know, the commercialization of it all. And this brings about, uh, this, this kind of leads into our, our next question a little bit, which I think is really interesting um, and perhaps plays into the monetization part a little bit. But uh, how do you think about born digital collections, uh, things that aren't analog to begin with, and how do you make those more accessible in a physical space as you know as well as in the digital space so essentially working with two spaces and um making that available to all how do, how do we do that and how do we make that a reality these are such excellent questions <laughs> such excellent questions i teach oral history and i think about you know oral histories are born digital and soundcloud I mean, it was just like amazing that my students were uploading to SoundCloud and, and sharing and editing. And it was just like they were creating a personal archive of all of this, this information. And so, again, every person is able to be his or her own historian, the keeper of their own story. And so you have, you know, so many resources on, on iTunes and there's, there's just, you know, a plethora of, of formats and, and wave files. And I mean, there was just a time when you, you couldn't drag and drop. I mean, think of how far we've come with dragging and dropping. <laughs> when you had these, you know, interfaces that did not communicate that, you know, now Androids and, and iOS systems are compatible. That didn't happen five years ago, three years ago. So now you can get apps. I mean, it has been, it's revolutionized digital technologies and the way that we are able to access information. And our next question is uh, more about the strategy of this. So why does the uniqueness of a collection, as, as you mentioned earlier in your presentation, matter as far as rationalizing what gets digitized first? Is it just a way to prioritize or is it something else? 
it's it's a combination. Uh, the struggle that we have is: do you digitize something that is unique, or do you digitize something to just process it? And so every time, you know, we're making hard choices about what if what about these materials? You know, if, so for example, like if there's a a research need. Or um, sometimes it's just a faculty member who comes down and says, you know, I, I heard about this collection. Not only is it not processed, it's could it be digitized? And then that becomes a priority. So who is going to use it? Who is our user going to be? How will they benefit from this material? I just remember when I was doing oral histories, there was this whole debate about which ones were tr got transcribed. And that became a whole hierarchy of what is the priority? So, you know, it's like, well, these topics talk about this particular issue and, and that's timely in, in what we're talking about in the you know, cultural realm. Digitization is subjected to the same type of, of questions of, again, how useful and how valuable is this going to be to our user? And I think that is a uh, great point to end on because I know that we're close to the end of our time and we oh. still have a couple of more questions, but, I will encourage you to uh, to perhaps log into the forum and answer those for some of our folks. Uh, lots of great questions in I there. Will. And I'm so glad. Thank you for them. I really appreciate it. It's nice to talk to people who really are passionate and, and, and want to do this type of work because, you know, I, I know so many people who think like, I'm the traditional archivist. I don't want to talk about digitization. I just, you know, I don't want to deal with it. <laughs> It's always nice to talk about people who are forward thinking and innovative. I just, I'm just amazed at like what information is available. You, you can look at it in the middle of the night. You know, you can just look at it as many times as you like. You can download it. You can save it. You can share it. It's just, it's just amazing. It's amazing. There's like no hoarding. You know, it's just amazing. <laughs> It is truly amazing what kind of content is out there and how much There's of it is so out there. There's so much. There's so much. Um, any any final remarks for us, Dr. Jones? This has been a fabulous presentation. Thank you very much. This has been a wonderful opportunity for me. I have learned so much as well. So I, I hope it's been informative and education educational for all of you because as I was going through preparing my slides, I was like, my goodness, wow. And there's so much I did not talk about. So please, I, I apologize if there's something that you think, well, she didn't cover this or cover that. I mean, you know, I had less than 40 minutes, but I tried to get in the, the main points really what I think is, is a good start of a discussion. You know, Lindsay and Elizabeth will have two more, there'll be two more workshops and they'll go into more detail about the actual processing and the work of digitization. But just to really understand, I wanted to convey the why. Why is it, you know, how did I come to the work? Why is it special to me? And, and how I think it's useful in terms of outreach and engagement and instruction. Absolutely. And thank you so much again, Dr. Jones. It's really thank been a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. This has been wonderful. And uh, thank you all to our viewers for attending the first technical workshop of our uh, Managing Digitization Projects module. Uh, after each module, just as a reminder, all four videos will be available on our website, as well as a complete toolkit of resources provided by all of our presenters. Um, if you would like the toolkit pre-broadcast, uh, we ask that you sign up ahead of time on our Eventbrite website, and you can access those links through our Museum Hub uh, website itself. So be sure to sign up for next week's webinar, and the toolkit will be emailed to you ahead of time. And you can always review past webinars on our website as well through our Learn tab, and then click on Past Webinars. So final uh, housekeeping notes and reminders, Please remember to visit the forum on our website to ask more of your questions and to get answers. As we mentioned, a student technology fellow or a member of our community will answer you. Be sure to follow us on social media to stay aware of future programs. Links will be provided in the chat for those. And please remember to complete the post-event satisfaction survey. Your feedback is very important to us and informs the work that we do here at the Digital Empowerment Project. And lastly, be sure to join us next week for technical workshop number two, which will be our intermediate level, how to build a digitization project, which will be held on Tuesday, June 22nd, 2021 at 11 a.m. Pacific time and 2 p.m. Eastern time. 
Our presenter will be Lindsay Richardson, owner of Museum Person. Thank you all for joining us for today's presentation and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your week and we hope to see you next week. Take care.